Hello, everybody. This is Robert Barton here at North Carolina State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is The Restoration of American Chestnut. So, Michelle, you say you're not hearing anything. Um, if you're having trouble today with uh, your audio, I ask that you go to Tools, Audio, Audio Setup Wizard, and run through the wizard real quick. That should help you with any audio trouble you might be having. Uh, is everybody else hearing me okay? If so, you can go ahead and uh, give me a, a smiley face or something, thumbs up. All right, good. I'm glad. Let me uh, quickly clear everybody's responses there. So today we're going to talk about the restoration of the American chestnut, and our presenters today will be Stacy Clark with the USDA Forest Service Southern Research Station in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Brian Bur Burham with the American Chestnut Foundation in Asheville, North Carolina. Before we turn it over to them, let me remind you, if you're participating in today's session uh, and you're looking for continuing education credits, at the end of today's session, you'll need to complete a satisfaction survey, take and pass the short quiz at the end of the webinar, and then complete the continuing education form with your continuing uh, education programs license or identification information in order for us to email you that certificate. If you complete all these steps, that certificate will be emailed to you directly immediately following the completion of those steps. Before we get too far, in case there are several of you that may be new to uh, webinars or at least new to Collaborate, Collaborate is made up of several different panels. Uh, you have your audio video, video panel, your participant panel, and the chat panel. And then the whiteboard where the presentation is taking place. It's important to know how to participate in any possible polling that might take place. Uh, you'll see there's an icon button right, uh, the fourth button in a row right under your name there. And that's for participating in polls. You'll be able to click on that button and choose a response. The poll questions of maybe multiple choice or true false type questions, if they are any available in this uh, presentation today. Also, if you got any comments or questions that you want to send to us, feel free to use the chat window. Uh, go ahead and type your questions in there, and our presenters will get to them as uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, as we move forward, if you got any concerns, though, about uh, having trouble hearing, uh, any technical difficulties or something, please put that in the chat window. I'll be monitoring that, and I'll do what I can to help you through the process. So our first poll up, let me set up the uh, type of poll for you. If you could respond A, B, C, D, or E to this poll, why did you join today's webinar? So if we can get a few more people to respond, then I'll publish those results up. Folks that are entering it in the chat window, if you'd please respond by clicking on the button right below your name with the letter A in it. That's for polling, uh, responding to the polls. You'll find that uh, in the participant list there. Okay, let me publish those results up so our, everybody can see uh, what those responses are. As you can see, most people are here for it's about equal split between subject matter and subject matter and continuing education credits. So let me clear those results. 
This webinar is made possible through partnerships. Uh, the series, the Forestry Natural Resource Webinar Series and Portal is a partnership through myself, Robert Barton here with North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, Bill Hubbard with the Extension Forestry in the Southern Region, and then Eric Taylor with Texas AgriLife Extension. This is really though possible through the partnership here in the southeast through our 13 um, land grant universities, uh, our partners with our 1890 institutions, our historical black colleges, and with the U.S. Forest Service as well as others. Next up, I'd like to pull, uh, get an idea of where our participants are from. So at this time, could you please respond to this poll? Again, to be able to respond to a poll, please click on the icon button right below your name. It's the fourth button it's on the right, and you'll see a letter, little letter A in it. If you're having trouble with the audios, please go to Tools, Audio, and Audio Setup Wizard, and that should help correct your audio trouble that you may be having today. Julie, thanks for uh, pushing that out on the chat window for me. Thank you. Okay, let's publish our results and s out to the whiteboard so we can uh, see where everybody is responding from to. As I would expect, the majority of us are here in the eastern time zone, but we do have folks uh, as far away as the Pacific time zone, and we do appreciate that. Next up, let me clear the results. Okay, one more poll to give our presenters an idea of who their audience is. Okay, I'm going to publish those results up to the whiteboard. And we have a good mix of audience, everything from extension educators through government professionals, private resource professionals, and landowners. Thank you for responding to the polls. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Brian Burhans, with the American Chestnut Foundation. Brian? Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to talk about a great story, the restore, restoration of the American chestnut. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Dr. Stacy Clark for uh, my co-presenter today, and I also want to say a big thank you to NC State and the U.S. Forest Service for hosting this webinar today. Uh, U.S. Forest Service has been a long-term, fantastic partner of the American Chestnut Foundation um, in helping us restore this great species back to our forest. Just a brief introduction uh, about the American Chestnut Foundation. Our mission is straightforward and focused. It's to restore the American chestnut to our eastern woodlands to benefit our environment, our wildlife, and our society. We're a 501c3 nonprofit conservation organization. We're headquartered in Asheville, North Carolina, a relatively small organization. We have 18 staff. Uh, a research center in southwestern Virginia. But the backbone of the American Chestnut Foundation is our 16 state chapters representing over almost 6,000 members from Maine to Georgia uh, that implement our breeding program long term. You know, we've often seen chestnuts. Uh, most of us have seen chestnuts as we drive around. But I want to tr bring your attention uh, right now to the bottom of that tree. And I'll put a little square under it. 
that's an individual uh, standing there uh, next to that tree. That's what an American chestnut looks like. We're used to seeing American or Chinese chestnuts often growing in our communities. They're short. Uh, they have big, broad crowns. The American chestnut grew much differently than the Chinese chestnut. It was a very fast-growing, tall tree. Uh, there are records of chestnuts reach, reaching 16 feet in diameter and living over 300 years. And this tree was often referred to as the redwood uh, of the East. Uh, most of us are very familiar with the story of the chestnut, how we lost it. Those of you taking the, the quiz later, here's a couple tidbits that you'll be interested in. The, the chestnut blight, this fungus that wiped through the range of the American chestnut in the early 1900s, uh, was first discovered and described in New York. Uh, the chestnut blight uh, went through the range very quickly, and by 1940 and 1950, it had pretty much reduced chestnut population to a forest full of chestnut stump sprouts. And it remains that way today. The chestnut is not extinct, but it has ceased to evolve as a species because it can no longer reach the uh, height and age where it can successfully reproduce with other chestnuts uh, in order to move the population forward. Uh, there's just too few trees, American trees, out there in the forest today that reach sexual maturity, can reproduce uh, and produce seed. And unfortunately, even if chestnuts, another interesting tidbit is that even though the chestnut, if it was completely removed from the forest, the chestnut blight would still be here. This fungus, this introduced pathogen from Asia would still be here um, even if the chestnuts were gone. It can survive on leaf litter, on bark from other species, so it, it would always be here. And there's some interesting aspects about the biology and ecology of the American chestnut. This is a tree that grew on, could grow on very dry sites. You'd see it growing on mountaintops. Uh, from the American chestnut standpoint, we're able to use this tree and do a lot of planting on abandoned mine lands, which look like moonscapes. Uh, in fact, we're working with the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, to develop 12 demonstration sites over the coal, within the coal region of the United States to demonstrate how you can do some simple practices to actually turn these abandoned and mine lands back into healthy, diverse forest woodlands uh, once again. And the American chestnut was a very important species from the standpoint of wildlife. Uh, as most of you know, oak species, which are very important for producing food for wildlife in the fall, uh, go through cycles of abundance, abundant mast in years when there's no mast available. Uh, the chestnut was a prolific, consistent producer of chestnut. It produced much more seed crop uh, as compared to oak species. For example, a mature white oak would produce about 1,000 nuts in a good year as compared to the American chestnut, which would produce over 6,000 nuts on a mature tree. And most of us understand that the health of our wildlife is dependently directly tied to reproductive output. If wildlife are in good, healthy condition, uh, they can reproduce more successfully, whether you're talking about black bear, white-tailed deer, wild turkey, or other species. But what's important about the American chestnut is that it did produce these nuts every year. It flowers later in the spring. It's not subject to frost damage as are oaks and other tree species. And the nut itself is very nutritious. Uh, it is higher in lipid content, uh, especially compared to Chinese chestnut, but it's very high in lipid content, very balanced nutritionally, and very good for wildlife. Not only was the American chestnut very important for many species of wildlife, the loss of the American chestnut had a dramatic impact to our rural communities. Uh, the chestnut tree itself was used for many products such as charcoal furniture, uh, fence posts, uh, railroad ties, telephone poles. In fact, you can go to the New England states today and find chestnut trees that are still being used as telephone poles that are still in the ground today. Another tidbit of information for those of you taking the test later is that the chestnut is very rot resistant and it is more much more rot resistant than oak for example. Again I mentioned earlier how large this tree was and it really hit at a bad time in the country. Uh, the 1930s and 1940s obviously were very uh, rough for especially rural residents in Appalachia. But the promise of restoring the American chestnut and what it could mean not only as a forest tree but as an agricultural crop is fairly dramatic. Uh, we currently import into the United States about $20 million worth of chestnuts, mostly from Chinese chestnuts annually, which represents less than five acres, 500 acres of chestnut orchard. 
Uh, the average U.S. consumption is about one ounce of chestnut annually. Now, when you compare that and contrast it to European contrast, where the average consumption is about one pound per year in Europe and almost two pounds of chestnut in Asia. Now, historically, before the chestnut blight took out the chestnut, chestnuts were collected for the nuts. They were put on rail cars. They were sent to major metropolitan areas um, and sold by street vendors uh, and used very commonly as a common food item. But the chestnut's been gone for 100 years. So it's kind of been erased from our uh, recent memory of the, how important chestnut was. Uh, if you look at today, if we could build up demand according to European levels that currently are, uh, it would take about 120,000 acres of chestnut orchards to supply that U.S. consumption and would create a, approximately a $300 million agricultural industry in the United States. So beyond just wildlife and, and healthy forests and good forest products, there's also an important agricultural commodity, the potential there uh, for the American chestnut. Of course, the chestnut was ravaged by this, this blight, uh, this fungus, which was, of course, uh, accidentally introduced. It probably came through two ports, New York and probably Charleston. Um, so it was introduced, dumped into North America. We had these American chestnuts that had very low, if any, resistance, natural resistance to this, this fungus, who spent its time evolving with Chinese these chestnut and over thousands of years, these trees, the fungus was probably weak when it first showed up. The tree was weak in resistance, but the two interacted over thousands of years. You take this very strong pathogen, this strong fungus, dump it on North America, where it's the first time these chestnuts have experienced this type of blight, and the impacts were devastating. In fact, the loss of the chestnut is often considered one of the biggest, largest uh, ecological disasters of recent times. Well, obviously, the key to restoring the species is to put resistance back into the American chestnut so it can survive in the face of the chestnut blight, again, because it will always be here. And the American Chestnut Foundation is approaching this in two different ways. One is our back cross, our uh, classical back cross breeding program. This is the program uh, that our chapters are implementing, that we're implementing on a national level. And the goal of that program, obviously, is to take resistance from the Chinese chestnut and incorporate that into the American chestnut, but end up with a product that is really an American chestnut with just enough of the ge uh, genes for resistance for the chestnut blight. In addition to the back cross breeding program, our New York State chapter, the American Chestnut Foundation, in partnership with the State University of New York, uh, Environmental Sciences and Forestry, is looking at biotechnology techniques to put resistance into American chestnut. In addition to our partnership with State University of New York, we're also partnering with the Forest Health Initiative, have over the last four years, uh, to try to look at using biotechnology as a tool to do that. But just kind of to fast forward here a little bit to uh, our back cross breeding program. You know, the goal here is to introduce genetic material uh, that is responsible for the resistance to the Chinese tree back into the American species. Well, our goal here isn't to develop a horticultural variety like you would think of as a rose or uh, even an agricultural crop like wheat. Uh, we're actually trying to put the right genetics into the American chestnut so the species can once again begin to evolve. Right now, as I mentioned before, that the American chestnut is not extinct. Uh, it's probably 10%, the population today is probably about 10% of what it was historically. After all, the chestnut range was over, it was about 4 billion chestnut trees, over 200 million acres from Maine to Georgia that were essentially wiped out as an overstory tree as a result of the chestnut blight. Our goal as a foundation is to bring a tree that has the right stuff, that has enough of the levels of resistance that the species can once again grow, sexually reproduce with other chestnuts, and again allow that population to continue to evolve over time. Just to give you a little short course on the backcross breeding program, the key to the breeding program is, you know, when you think of hybrids, you think of uh, Chinese and an American chestnut, and that's exactly where we started. In fact, it's thanks to the Connecticut Agricultural uh, Experiment Station in New Haven, Connecticut, that TACF got some of its original material to start its back cross breeding program. So you cross a Chinese and an American tree, and I'll see if I can find the pointer here. Um, at the top, you'll see the Chinese and American, those those two at 
you end up with a hybrid that's 50-50. Um, as you step back then, as you move down the breeding process, you back cross to three different American trees. Uh, so that's where we build in the genetic diversity of the American type. It's not enough for the American chestnut to just have blight resistance. If you take a, even an F1 hybrid, uh, the 50% Chinese, 50% American, you dump it out in our fast-growing, aggressive eastern hardwood forest, the tree is not going to do very well because it can't attain the height to capture that canopy and get that sunlight. The tree will become stressed, and even the Chinese chestnut can succumb to the chestnut blight if it's put under tress, stress. So not only do we need a tree that has the genetics for blight resistance, but we m also, equally important, need American chestnuts to have the growth characteristics of the American chestnut. In other words, we need an American chestnut, that, and that's our goal is to produce that American chestnut. Now, when the, uh, the breeding program was first developed, it was introduced by a named man plant breeder named Dr. Charles Burnham, and he developed this Burnham hypothesis, and the hypothesis stated that after making this initial cross, back crossing three times to an American chestnut, doing some intercrosses, there's a lot of detail that goes into that. It takes about 30 years to get to the point where we develop a tree that is approximately 15 sixteenths or 94 percent American chestnut with the remainder of the genetics being that from the Chinese chestnut. That this tree would be fairly indistinguishable from the American chestnut and would have good levels of resistance. Now, when Dr. Burnham developed that program, there were a lot of things he didn't know about the chestnut, and some of those questions are still not answered today. And I'll talk to the uh, explain that a little bit when we talk about our breeding program. You know, there's another disease out there that I'll just quickly mention, but it is absolutely critical to the restoration of the American chestnut, and that's a disease called ink disease. It's called by an, caused by an organism called Phytophthora simomomai. Uh, this is a different species than the species of Phytophthora that causes sudden oak death, and many of us are familiar with what sudden oak death has done in the western United States. Uh, this is a different species, but it is absolutely lethal to American chestnut, especially at low level elevations where you've got heavy soils and poor drainage. Uh, this is a, a disease that the American Chestnut Foundation is working in partnership with many partners, such as the U.S. Forest Service and Clemson University, to develop trees that are resistant not only to the blight, but also resistant to ink disease. And fully restoring the chestnut to our eastern forest will require us to have trees that are able to withstand both diseases. As I mentioned earlier, the backbone of the American Chestnut Foundation is our 16 state chapters. They've developed over 300 breeding orchards, and each one of these red dots on the map represents a breeding orchard from Maine to Georgia. Almost all of them are all volunteer run, working in partnership with trained professional research scientists. Each of these breeding orchards develops what we call locally adapted material. They're using in that breeding program, if you remember back to that chart, the American chestnuts, are they're using chestnuts from their state, from their region. So at the end of that breeding program, at least at that 15, 16 uh, juncture, we're ending up with an American chestnut that is from that region. If you think about it, if you're a chestnut and you grew up and evolved in the state of Alabama and you stuck yourself in the main, you would not be a very happy chestnut tree. So trees that are locally adapted in their region, we want to keep those genetics there so the trees uh, are going to be more vigorous growers, better adapted to the region, and long term do much better. But what's amazing is, with this is the partnership between state, private, and volunteers, what the power of volunteers can do to bring back the chestnut. And it's a la very labor-intensive process. Here's a photograph of our hand pollination. Uh, most of the breeding work is done by hand, where we're taking pollen uh, and pollinating these trees. The bags are used to keep pollen from other trees from uh, getting onto the uh, flowers. So it's very, very time-intensive process. Again, it's taken us almost 30 years to get to the point where we are now. And this really, really only represents the beginning of a long-term process of testing, evaluation, and modifying our breeding program so we can introduce better and better material over time. So you ask yourself, well, what does a disease-resistant tree look like? And I mentioned back in that breeding chart that when you get down to the very end, the 15th, 16th, or 94% American, the, the theory was that that would be a tree that was essentially uh, resistant to the chestnut blight. Now, we've learned information along the way that not all of these are blight resistant right now. But to give you an idea of what blight resistant looks like, this is our two photographs that were taken this spring from our research farm in southwest Virginia. 
And these are our most latest uh, trees, most advanced lines of potentially blight-resistant trees. We call them our restoration chestnuts. If you look at the chestnut tree on the left, you'll notice that we have inoculated the trees or put the fungus on the trees in two places. Uh, the first place we put on the top and the second spot we put on the bottom. And we actually put the fungus in there, put tape over it, and see how the tree responds to the fungus. This tree has little to no resistance to the blight. Now, if you look, this, this photograph was taken about 20 feet away. This tree was inoculated with the fungus. By inoculation, in other words, we're just simply putting the fungus in there. And you'll see that the tree is cankered up, and it stopped the spread of the chestnut blight. This is a tree that's showing resistance. It's non-immunity. The tree is still affected by the blight, but long term, the hope is, is that that is nothing more than a superficial wound to the tree. In contrast, the photo on the left, that tree's toast, and I, it's probably dead right now. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Stacy Clark. Um, thank you, Brian, for that great introduction to American chestnut restoration work. And I'd also like to thank all the um, folks that are involved in putting on this webinar, and particularly Bob for walking us through um, how to do this webinar yesterday. Um, so what you see here, let me try to get the pointer up, is um, some pictures that I've taken in the field from chestnut plantings. And let me just first say that I do work for the US Forest Service. I'm a research forester. And I'm kind of leading the charge in terms of looking at how these trees perform in the forest. And I also work with the University of Tennessee's Tree Improvement Program very closely. And there's other cooperators that have helped us along the way, such as Clemson University, um, the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station, and of course, the American Chestnut Foundation. But these uh, pictures you see in the upper left-hand corner is um, from a two-year-old seedling that we planted that has both male and female flowers, which is pretty remarkable. And um, the upper middle. Uh, picture is of Turks caps lilies that we've seen on some of our planting sites. And on the right side, there's a turkey footprint that was in one of the chestnut plantings. So when these trees start producing nuts, um, those turkeys will surely benefit. Um, on the middle right is a bear print. Um, again, bears would eat chestnuts um, when available. And then in the middle, in the very center of the slide is the chestnut sawfly. It's a native insect that's very rare. Um, and we have seen it on some of the chestnuts that we've planted in the field. And then the left middle picture is of the chestnut-sided warbler, um, appropriately named. It's not sitting on a chestnut tree, but it was in one of the chestnut plantings. And then, of course, the bottom picture is of black bears near one of the chestnut plantings. Um, the goal of our research program uh, that I'm um, helping to lead is to test the material that we get from the American Chestnut Foundation um, that have been traditionally bre bred for blight resistance. And we're specifically looking at the ability of those seedlings to survive, compete, and remain blight resistant in forest conditions within the species' native range. So we're planting these trees out in the forest and harvested on harvested sites to test how, once we get a tree that we can say is fully blight resistant, how is that tree going to survive and compete in natural conditions? And the picture you're looking at here is of a three-year-old seedling that we planted in North Carolina, and that's um, growth after three years. So it, the chestnuts do grow very, very fast and are very competitive. Um, so far, we've established 11 plantings um, across three three years on national forests in Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina. Again, these are in harvested um, site conditions. And I'll just say a little bit about the sites themselves. They're um, medium to high quality sites, um, high elevation sites, um, and sites that would have contained historically American chestnut. Uh, we've planted a total of 4,596 trees, and that includes a mixture of American and Chinese as the parental species, and we consider those controls. So the Chinese chestnuts are fully blight resistant, and the American chestnuts are blight susceptible. And then we have the different breeding generations up to the B3F3, which is the 15th, 16th um, chestnut that Brian talked about earlier. Uh, we used, in all of those plantings that I just described, we used bare root nursery seedlings. So these are seedlings that were grown in a commercial tree nursery for one year, lifted, and then planted. 
um, the seedlings were grown to maximize seedling quality. This was important because we knew that deer would be on the sites um, wanting to browse the seedlings, and we knew that because we planted on medium to high quality sites, that, that the sites would contain species like yellow poplar and red maple, and that these chestnut seedlings needed to be able to compete with those natural um, species. So we wanted to plant trees that were high in quality in terms of being able to grow quickly to overcome deer browse and the natural competitors. We also tested seedling quality by splitting the seedlings into two size classes, large and small, to determine effects on growth and survival. And the picture you see is me holding one-year-old um, commercial nursery seedlings that we were about to plant in the field. And we take all kinds of data on every single tree. Some trees we actually have the weight of the nut, um, and we count roots on all the seedlings, measure height and root collar diameter coming out of the nursery before we plant it. And then we plant it into an experimental design in order to be able to test the effect of generation and genetic family um, on growth and survival and blight resistance. We planted these seedlings in a newly harvested sites like you see here in this picture. We used um, modified planting bars. This is a KBC bar that we modified to make slightly larger to accommodate the large size of the seedlings. Um, we did treat on the site stump sprouts um, because we knew that even though the seedlings we were planting were considered high quality, that the, the chances of them being able to compete with a yellow poplar stump sprout is probably minimal. So we treated stump sprouts with herbicide um, to uh, give the chestnuts a better chance of survival and growth. And the picture you see here is a planting in Virginia um, at year zero. So this is at the time of planting. And the next slide is going to show you what the the site, that same site looks like at year four. So this is what I mean by highly competitive site. So you can see the regrowth on that site that is pretty much all from seedling competition, so germinate seedlings. Um, so you know, Brian talked a lot about blight resistance and resistance to um, other diseases, but it's going to be just as important to determine if these trees can compete on these highly competitive sites as it will be to determine blight resistance. Uh, despite our attempts at producing high quality seedlings, we did have deer browse um, specifically on our 2009 plantings because the, high, the seedling quality on those plantings was slightly lower than what we would have wanted and that was just simply because um, growing conditions in the nursery are highly variable and you can't always get what you want um, out of the nursery due to weather and things like that. Um, so at uh, the Tennessee planting that first year, 80% of our seedlings were browsed. That is the terminal of the seedling was browsed. And then we had lesser amounts of browse at the other two plantings. So what we did was we put up these tree shelters um, on these trees. And we did not use enclosed tubes because we felt like that would impact the growth of the seedling. And it would also maybe um, favor development of blight by making that um, seedling slightly hotter inside the tube. So we used these. Um, they're called bark protectors, and they're five feet tall. And they worked quite well, with the exception of they're kind of hard to maintain. So they do require a lot of maintenance um, in the field. But they were effective at keeping the deer off the seedlings. So um, by the second year in the 2009 plantings, the trees had pretty much overcome the browsing effects that they saw in year one. Um, and at the time of planting in those 2009 plantings, only 7% of the trees were above browse line, which is about 4.5 feet in height. And we did some uh, analysis of that, and we determined that a 20-inch tree at planting is five times more likely to be browsed than a 60-inch tree. So this gets back to the issue of seedling quality and the importance of seedling quality. Um, by the third year, almost 60% of our trees were above browse line. So um, at this point in time, we're entering our we're in our fourth growing season, and I would guess 80% of our trees are now above browse line. Um, let's talk about third year growth. Um, total height for the seedlings from the 2009 plantings is, is approximately six feet, and you can see um, in the photo the top of a nine foot tall tree. This is after three three growing seasons. Um, we did some statistical analyses, and we determined that the American chestnuts and the B3S3s were significantly taller than the Chinese chestnuts, which is no surprise because the Chinese are generally not competitive in the field. Um, however, one negative uh, finding was that the Americans were significantly taller than the B3S3s. 
Um, and so this is a deviation of the expectation that the B3F3s are going to behave similar to the Americans with the exception of the blight resistance. Um, so we'll keep following this and determining if the B3F3s are going to remain shorter than the Americans or if they're going to catch up to the Americans. This is still very early um, in the uh, growth of these seedlings. And looking at seedling quality, large size class trees were taller than small size class trees at the end of the third growing season, and that resulted in a 13 inch difference. Um, in terms of survival, we have 80% survival across all the 2009 sites. That's across all generations and parental species. Um, there were um, differences um, between the parental species and the generations. The Chinese had lower survival at the Tennessee planting compared to the rest of the generations and Americans, which again we kind of expected because Chinese are not generally as competitive as other seedlings. Um, the B3S3 had similar survival to Americans at all planting. So we're not seeing any differences between the Backcross uh, third generation and the Americans, which is good news. We, it's still really too early to determine blight on these trees. We're not inoculating anything. We're letting um, the blight come in naturally. So we're only seeing blight on 5% of the trees, and that's really too early to say anything about resistance. Um, in the picture, you'll see this is third year um, growth on a seedling that we planted in North Carolina. The top of the tree there, it's about 13 feet tall. So we're getting fantastic growth on some of these seedlings. For the 2010 plantings, we had a problem on one of the plantings with root rot. Now, we had two plantings that we put in in 2010, and they're the, mi the same mixture of seedlings. This, they came from the same nursery. The reason we had one planting affected by root rot and not the other, I think, was because one planting was on a relatively um, poorly drained site, and we think that that's contributing greatly to the ink disease um, proliferating at that site. So one of the sites seems to have fairly good survival despite the presence of ink disease, and the other site is pretty much wiped out, um, less than 40% survival at this point. On the site that has pretty good survival, we're seeing an average of 6.6 .6 feet in height after two growing seasons. So in 2010, the seedling quality was actually higher than in 2009 despite the presence of ink disease at, that, at those two plantings. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The 2011 plantings, um, unfortunately, these plantings are pretty much compromised by Phytophthora, which is the ink disease. Um, overall survival ranges from 51 to 83 percent. We planted six plantings in 2011, and the survival ranges um, pretty greatly from site to site, we think, based on site quality characteristics that would um, allow Phytophthora cinnamomy to prol proliferate at those sites. We had negative growth across all sites because of the dieback that we're seeing, we think, from the Phytophthora cinnamomy. In the picture there, you can see um, that's actually Gary Griffin from the American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation holding one of our seedlings that has Phytophthora cinnamomy on it. Um, you can see it's called ink disease because of the black exudate that comes on the root system there after it's been infected. So what is this Phytophthora cinnamomy? Um, it's an exotic fungal pathogen that actually came in um, prior to the 1870s. I, I said in the 1870s, but it's actually prior to the 1870s. Um, it attacks chestnut, shortleaf pine, and Fraser fir. It's actually most virulent in clay compacted soils that are not well drained. Chestnuts show little, um, American chestnuts show little resistance naturally to this pathogen. There's not really any chemical treatment that's effective in terms of large scale restoration. And here's the big point I want to make is that we believe that the Phytophthora cinnamomy is coming in, into the sites from our trees that we're planting because we're planting these seedlings that are from a commercial nursery. So the commercial nursery soil is infected with Phytophthora cinnamomy that gets on the seedlings. It's massed somewhat at the time of planting because the seedlings are young and, and growing very fast in the nursery. In, the nurseries generally use fungicides, and that masks the effect of Phytophthora cinnamomy. But when you go plant it out in the field, the Phytophthora cinnamomy is still on the roots and then can spread and kill the seedlings that you've just planted. So this is a major obstacle that we have to overcome. Um, so one of the options is to plant seedlings that are grown in containers um, with soil free from the disease. And another um, option is to grow seedlings in northern nurseries where Phytophthora is not able to live. It does not really grow in latitudes above 40 um, degrees. And here's some uh, 
some more pictures of the Phytophthora cinnamomi. And I showed you the one on the left. The one on the right is an above ground portion of that same tree. So you'll see signs of yellowing and chlor chlorosis in the seedling before it dies. And this usually comes on very quickly. We've had confirmations at all of our sites um, by pathology experts on Phytophthora and the effects of this disease at various sites differs, I think, in relation to the site quality characteristics. I think Phytophthora does not proliferate well on high, higher elevation sites or well-drained sandy soils. Um, we are underestimating the presence of the disease because we're only digging up trees that are dead or dying. So um, we're not able to really get a really good handle on how many trees are being affected by this disease in our, in our plantings. And this is my only data slide showing that um, in the red, these are seedlings that were confirmed to have Phytophthora cinnamomi in, in the black, seedlings that did not have confirmations of Phytophthora cinnamomi. And you can see that the Chinese, there was no confirmations of Chinese having Phytophthora. So therefore, there's some resistance, probably high levels of resistance in the Chinese to Phytophthora cinnamomi. And the Americans and the B3F3s, um, quite a few of them succumb to this disease. We've also seen other pests out in the field that I just briefly want to talk about. The Asiatic oak weevil, which is this little guy right here. Um, he's a very small insect. Came in um, in the mid-1930s to the United States. And um, basically, it defoliates the seedlings in the mid to late growing season. And the larvae actually feed on the root systems. We're actually doing a study right now with Bud Mayfield and the Southern Research Station to look at the effects of defoliation on the different generations and the abundance of Asiatic oak weevil in a couple of our plantings. We've identified this insect at four plantings. Actually, I need to up that to five plantings. Uh, we saw another um, insect at another planting this past September. We've also seen Asian gall wasp, which is um, an insect that basically lays its larvae inside the buds of the chestnut. And we've identified this insect at five plantings. Um, we also have Asian ambrosia, Asian ambrosia beetle hole, excuse me, um, identified at one planting. And so all of these pests are non-native. They've come from uh, Asia, and the impacts that they could have could be quite significant on um, the American chestnut. And there's really no adequate control measures at this time for these insects. We've also seen native um, pests, um, including the chestnut sawfly, which I talked about earlier. Um, we've had a, one chestnut pretty severely dam uh, one chestnut planting severely damaged by cicada. And basically what this does is it kills um, portions of the twigs by the um, cicadas laying their larvae inside the twigs. We've had squirrels chewing on the bark of some of our seedlings. Um, and that's had some effect, not, not much. We have tree hoppers, which is an insect that does the same thing, lays its larvae inside the twigs. And that can cause dieback to some of the twigs. We've had caterpillar defoliation, um, other insect defoliation, and of course, deer browse and deer rub. And this is a picture showing a four-year-old chestnut tree that we planted in Tennessee. And you can see it's quite large. And so there is success. I don't want to appear to be like all of our chestnuts are dying or, or succumbing to um, pests and pathogens. We, we will see success with, with these, some of these chestnut trees. It will depend on how well these trees can adapt to this natural environment and resist exotic pests, um, including blight. Um, the 2009 plantings are doing the best because we had minimal Phytophthora. Um, in those plantings, and we took um, great care to protect those seedlings from deer. And we are finding out that seedling quality does make a difference. Um, and chestnut grows extremely fast. I think it grows faster than a poplar. Um, it's very competitive. The B3F3, unfortunately, at least early on, is not behaving exactly like an American in height and also bud break. I didn't talk about that, but bud break phenology, um, the B3F3s are coming out slightly ahead of the Americans, which is a more of a Chinese characteristic. So we're examining, continuing to examine that trait. Phytophthora is going to be a major obstacle. And blight resistance, we're going to continue to monitor for blight and hopefully do some uh, more uh, refined testing of that this coming year. So what are we going to do about the Phytophthora issue? Well, we're going to look, hopefully, this fall at using containerized seedlings. However, the cost of this are quite high um, using containers. 
um, compared to growing bare root nursery seedlings um, does increase the cost about five to ten times. And we're going to try this method called the root pruning method. It's the most advanced, advanced technology available from a forest nursery in Missouri called the Forest Keeling Nursery. Um, and they grow uh, these seedlings that look like this one you see on the left, where uh, they have a really fibrous root system. Um, and so our goal is going to be to develop a seedling that we can plant efficiently in the field, but that is going to have high quality at the time of planting. We have to balance those two um, characteristics. And so I think this, at this time I'm turning it back over to Brian. Thank you, Stacy. You know, one of the things as we look at moving forward with restoration and the vision of restoration, one of the things that we have to understand is that it took us 30 years to get to this point where we actually have trees we can start to put in the ground and start to test. But we've got many more decades ahead of us of continual testing, evaluation, and improvement in the breeding to get this tree uh, restored uh, to the eastern United States. The material that we're planting right now is actually a product of our research farm in southwestern Virginia that's coming out of one orchard. Now this orchard is still in the process of being refined. In other words, uh, we're constantly culling out inferior trees or trees that do not show high levels of resistance from this breeding orchard. So the expectation is in the future that these trees will show better uh, resistance levels and a higher proportion of the trees coming out of the breeding program uh, would have higher levels of resistance. In addition, uh, again, the key to our and the backbone to our breeding program is are the local state chapter breeding orchards spread throughout the country. Uh, and again, as there's over 300 of these orchards. And it's the products that come out of these orchards that are hopefully more adapted locally uh, to perform better given local conditions. What's coming out of our material right now. Uh, right now, and you can go online at acf.org and look at our November-December issue of the Chestnut Journal, and you'll see a great article in there that explains in detail, um, and I saw a couple questions on the chat room about uh, what are we producing, how high a level of resistance uh, that we have. And again, I'll mention that we don't have to have a tree that's immune to the chestnut blight to be uh, successful in the forest. What we need is a tree that can, sex can successfully, uh, as Stacy said, and it's very critical, that it can grow like an American chestnut. It basically is an American chestnut. It can compete in our eastern forest. It can get above the brows of the deer. It can survive the blight and allow it to sexually reproduce with other trees. And again, evolution can now continue to start working on this chestnut population. But about 17% of the material this, uh, we just tested this past year um, that's coming out of our breeding program have moderate to high levels of blight resistance. Uh, not resistance equal to that of the Chinese chestnut, but very high levels of resistance. And that's very positive. Um, heck, I'd be honest with you, if I had 2% that were coming out of the uh, program, I'd be pretty ecstatic. Um, it just means I've got to plant more trees to get a few that will survive. But again, hopefully that'll, that'll get better over time. Um, we call these the Restoration Chestnuts 1.0, and the 1.0 is important to understand because we expect additional better versions to come out over time. Again, this isn't a matter of introducing a product and sending it out and saying we're done. Uh, we've learned those lessons. Other organizations have made mistakes to prematurely introduce material that's not ready, it's not tested, it's not vetted out into the open marketplace, and the trees don't work public loses support and the program goes away. Our program is built on sound science. We'll be testing and evaluating these trees. We expect to be doing this testing and, and planting for the next 30, 40, 50 years. And at some point in time, we'll reach a point where we've got a tree that has everything that we're looking for. And then uh, there'll be more and more chestnuts to be planted out in the woods. OK, next slide. One of the challenges as an organization, and we're so, we're so, uh, it's so wonderful to have such great partners like the U.S. Forest Service, our state forestry agencies, Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, our state university partners. If it wasn't for these partners, none of us could do what we do. I, I, I'm always I admire Stacy and how hard she works with such limited resources to do some of this testing, which is absolutely critical to understanding how we're going to re reintroduce this species 
on a landscape level scale. Um, so the information and the baseline information that Stacy has been collecting is going to be critical as we move forward with this restoration project and start doing low, larger reintroduction efforts. But one of our challenges is we've got to test and evaluate over a million of these test trees over the next seven years. When we plant these trees, it's, just, it's not a matter of just planting some seeds and walking away. These seedlings have to be monitored, evaluated, because then we go back to our breeding orchards and we determine which tree lines or families are performing, which tree lines are not performing, and we remove the non-performers from the breeding orchards, and that increases the uh, effectiveness of the uh, resulting material. But again, bottom line is we have to use the best science that's out there. There are a lot of questions about the chestnut we simply don't have the answers to. What's exciting about is where we're at today with the restoration of the American chestnut is that we're at the beginning of a long journey to actually reintroduce this species back into our forest. Uh, you know, no more than 30 years ago, people would have told you you're crazy. You can't bring back a tree species. You can't uh, develop a tree that has resistance to a disease. But through this long-term commitment and focus and great partnerships, we're now at a point where we can test and evaluate these trees. So I, on behalf of Stacy and of everybody, we are, we are grateful for the partnerships. Um, here's uh, some acknowledgments on this tree um, or on this program and some contact information uh, if you want to ask, more from, uh, ask for more information. Thank you. Stacy and Brian, thank you very much. Um, I see you guys have been answering questions in the chat window as you're going along. So folks, if you've uh, been watching the chat, you've been seeing their answers. If not, you might want to look back over some of those to see the ones that they've already addressed. So uh, let me see if I could. Uh... So here's one from Tom Ward. Uh, when you talk about seedling quality, Stacy, what specifically do you mean? Yeah, seedling quality um, is related to how well that seedling is going to survive and compete in the field. And we've done a lot of testing with oak species, and what we've determined, and some with chestnut now, and what we've determined is that the height of the seedling and the root collar of the seedling are most um, highly correlated with how that seedling is going to perform in the field. So basically, in a general sense, it's the size of the seedling. Um, but also, there's other um, subtle things that you can look at, too, like the bud set on the seedling and the number of roots on the seedling. But mainly, we mean the overall size of the seedling. All right, thank you. So Brian, when you say good resistance from 17% of chestnut 1.0, what does good mean? Uh, good means that the tree is responding to the pathogen. It is responding to the, the uh, uh, fungus. It is slowing the spread of the fungus. In other words, it's not killing a tree. If you look at an American chestnut, uh, that fungus within several months can kill that tree. Uh, moderate to high levels of resistance is showing that the tree is actually reacting to the pathogen. It is actually walling, trying to wall off and stop the spread. When the fungus infects the tree, what it get, does is it gets into the cambium layer. The tree actually shuts down the transfer of nutrients up and down the bowl of the tree. And essentially, the fungus causes the tree to strangulate itself. Uh, when, you, when the tree is showing signs or levels of resistance, it's able to slow that spread down. Um, so far, at least at this point, and it's very early in our analysis of the breeding program, uh, we're not seeing necessarily as high a levels as a Chinese chestnut. But as I mentioned earlier, those extreme high levels may not be required to allow the tree to at least initially start to, uh, again, begin uh, evolution. The goal is, obviously, to continue the breeding program to try to get those highest levels of resistance. All right, thank you. So here's a question. Are there any isolated stands of mature American chestnuts anywhere? Yes, there are. In fact, if you look at my opening photograph, and it's, a, it's an interesting story, I'll go ahead and swing back to it. Uh, this photograph here was taken in West Salem, Wisconsin. It's actually on one of our study sites. Um, there's so much information about the chestnut, we could spend hours talking about it. But this is a chestnut tree. I believe it was uh, the state champion tree. It did succumb to the blight uh, a few years ago. Um, and this tree is outside the traditional range of the chestnut pioneers took. This population of chestnuts in West Salem, Wisconsin, actually started from nine chestnuts 
planted about 1900 and now there's over 6,000 American chestnuts on this property today. It gives you the idea of how of a, of a great grower and, and, and prolific that this tree is. The research we're doing though is looking at a naturally occurring virus that actually infects the chestnut blight and slows the chestnut blight down. Essentially I always equate it to you're giving the chestnut blight the, the fungus. The hope through this research that we've been doing for many for a long time is that a combination of resistance in the trees and this hypovirus uh, could be two tools working together to help restore the species. Okay, thank you. So a couple folks have uh, brought up, uh, are you looking for test sites in other states like the Midwest and are you looking for other cooperative cooperators such as university researchers who have projects ready to plant but they need seed and who should they contact? The best way to contact is to go onto our website. Um, we're always looking for partners. That's the only way we can get all this done. Uh, and go on to ACF, as in alphacharliefox.org, and you can look under your local regional science coordinator. Uh, we have regional science coordinators in every part of the country, or they can just drop me an email at brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at acf.org, and uh, we can give you some more information and look at opportunities to partner. Okay, thank you. So uh, one more question and then I'll be pushing out the survey for everybody to take. Uh, can lay people plant these seeds? So oh, if a landowner or somebody like that was interested in it, is there uh, ways they can help? Absolutely. We have a, a program uh, within the American Chestnut Foundation called our Annual Sponsor Program, which, you know, we want to get these materials out to our cooperators, to our members, uh, so they can be part of our testing process. We established the Annual Sponsor Program as a way to help fund the science that we need to get done, and at the same time, give our cooperators an opportunity to start testing and evaluating these materials on their land. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity. Um, to watch these trees grow and see how they interact long term. Again, this is a long term process. This isn't, hey, we've got the final product, we're all said and done. It's the direct opposite. We're at the starting point of where we now can put these trees in the ground, test our hypotheses, and refine our programs moving forward. So again, go on to our ASC.org and there'll be information on the uh, annual sponsorship program. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, let me get back to uh, in our slides here. So just a reminder for those that are looking for continuing education credits, you'll need to not just complete the satisfaction survey, but also the short quiz and the request form for information so that the certificate can be emailed to you directly. Uh, we have over 160 participants in today's webinar. So when I push out the URL, I'm going to also post it in our uh, chat window here, but when it goes out uh, on the system, uh, realize it's going to open your browser and it may take a minute or two because of everybody that's involved in this process um, that's participating in the session. Now what happens is your browser will probably pop up in front of your uh, um, collaborate session there and you'll be able to just be patient and load it. Um, if you don't have time and you need to move on to something else, I suggest you copy it out of the chat window. You can copy that text and then paste it uh, into a Word document or something like that that you can save it for later. And with that, let's thank Brian and Stacy for all their work uh, and our partners with uh, the U.S. Forest Service, Claire Payne, also for her effort in bringing us to today's webinar. Thank you guys very much.